Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Nicholas Richardson and this is the news. Poland is celebrating the National Day of Remembrance of the Cursed Soldiers today for the ninth time. On 1st of March, Poles remember the tens of thousands of Polish underground soldiers who continued to fight on against the Soviet and Communist regimes following the Second World War. For their struggle for freedom, the fight has often paid the ultimate price. The Wączka section of the military cemetery Powolski in Warsaw is essential for understanding the story of the cursed soldiers. They fought alone. The Western world saw what was happening in Poland and remained silent. They were attacked not only with bullets, but first and foremost with hate speech. The search and exhumation works at Wączka ended in July 2017. More than 60 bodies were identified. We have found all the bodies buried here at Wączka and now we're trying to identify all of them and give them back their names. I'm asking everyone, be patient. It's a long process and it will take some time to identify them all, but I'm sure that this day will come. The remains of Andrzej Stryjewski's father haven't been found yet. He fought until the year 1949 when he was murdered at the Rakowiecka prison in Warsaw. His body is likely to have been thrown into one of the mass graves at Wączka. My dad hasn't been found and he may never be found. They hated him very much. He was given the death sentence 38 times, so they just as well might have disposed of his body entirely. The communists did worse things for revenge. The communist authorities also hunted down the cursed soldiers' children. They kept an eye on us all the time. They made sure that we couldn't get any proper education, we couldn't get into college or get a good job. They called us criminals in school. I remember how our teacher told my brother, you, criminal, come to the board. Along with Wączka, one of the most important and tragic places connected to the cursed soldiers is the prison at Rakowiecka Street. A year ago, it was transformed into the Museum of Cursed Soldiers. Among those murdered here were famous Polish heroes like General Emil Fieldorf, codenamed Nil, Rittmeister Witold Pilecki, Colonel Łukasz Ciepliński, Hieronim Dekutowski, codenamed Zapora, Zygmunt Szendzielasz, codenamed Łupaszka, and 300 other cursed soldiers. Just after the Second World War had ended, a few dozen thousand Polish soldiers fought against Soviet occupants. After 1947, there were no more than 2,000 of them left. We should be calling what was happening in Poland after 1944 a Soviet occupation and the struggle against the Soviets and the communists of the cursed soldiers, the last Polish uprising. The National Day of Remembrance of the Cursed Soldiers has been celebrated since 2011. The Law and Justice Party's new programme, introduced at last Saturday's Congress by party leader Jarosław Kaczynski, will cost over 40 billion złoty to put in place. Key elements of the programme include an extension of the popular 500 plus programme to cover the first child and not just the second and subsequent children as at present, and an additional annual payment of 1,100 złoty for pensioners. Today, the head of the Prime Minister's Chancellery, Michal Dworczyk, and government spokeswoman, Joanna Kopczynska talked about the implementation of the program in some detail. The question about the cost of these programs appears quite often. We have to say it clearly, 800 million zlotys per year. This amount will be allocated for more bus connections to smaller cities. When it comes to the income tax return, PEAT, people under the age of 26 will be exempt from paying personal income tax. The cost of this will reach to 2 between 3 billion zlotys. Taxpayers will pay 7 to 10 billion zlotys less to the state budget, so the income to the state budget will be lower. The so-called 13th pension is the program where retirees will get an annual additional benefit of 1,100 zlotys. This proposition will cost 9 to 10 billion zlotys per year. And the last point, an expansion of the 500 plus program for the families with one child as well. The cost of this reaches 18 billion zlotys per year. As it was before, citizens can file motions in the community they live in. They can do it by writing a letter or sending an email. The question about whether the 500 plus program for every first child will be counted in the income we are sure that the support people get from this program is not counted in the income, and this will remain the case. The mayor of Warsaw, Rafał Czaskowski, has been in office for 100 days, so now is a good time to review his record so far. In a speech today, Czaskowski emphasized a package of measures that it was claimed would make life easier for the Varsovians. But for the city residents, most noticeable so far is his rainbow agenda. 
He has already signed the LGBT plus declaration and established a diversity tram, which unfortunately broke down the day it was first sent out onto the streets. Ursula Regala has the story. During the 100 Days in Office conference, Rafał Trzaskowski listed the achievements of his mayorship. At the start of the term, we opened three kindergartens and we are accelerating construction of 15 new schools. Another issue is teachers' pay rises, which we implement with compensation from January. Then there is the nursery, because we have initiated the program of free nurseries and we are preparing nurseries for 1,000 more children. The health program, prevention, especially when it comes to dental issues. When it comes to women's programs, more money for in vitro and for vaccinations. When it comes to public transport, I already made decisions relating to new tram lines. We also have analysis concerning the possible extension of the second metro line. Patrick Jaki, who lost his mayoral election bid to Rafał Trzaskowski, is critical. We remember what he promised. We know that this very year he will not implement things he said were the most important. There are no promised metro lines planned, no promised 100 zlotys for each child for additional activities, no promised nurseries, no promised smog payments, there is no settlement for reprivatization. But what do we have? We have millions spent on LGBT, we have a diversity tram, we have attempts to build a museum of an anti-government street movement. That is where I think it is a disgrace. I mean the city is moving in an ideological direction and it should be moving towards improving the quality of life for people. Columnist Rafał Ziemkiewicz has no doubt that Trzaskowski's promises were nothing short of a pork barrel. His ambitions are for something higher. He is aiming for the prime minister's chair and even considering taking over the reins of the civic platform party from Donald Tusk after his supposed return to Poland. In any case, you can see that he really does not take care of Warsaw, everything stays the same. As before, Warsaw is ruled by Mr. Kierwiński, and it is a pity that he did not run, at least the situation would be obvious. The guy who ran and won is in charge and is accountable for delivering election promises. Rafał Trzaskowski won last year's race for the mayorship of Warsaw in the first round, receiving 56.7% of the votes. He was supported by over half a million Warsawians. David Kubatski of Poland achieved a spectacular victory on the normal hill at the World Championship ski jumping in Seyfeld. After managing a disappointing first jump of only 85.3 metres, Kubatski was in 27th place after the first round. The 28-year-old, who was part of the World Championship winning Polish team on the large hill two years ago, then produced a second jump of 104.5 metres, which was enough to catapult him into first position and the gold medal. As the resuming remaining field, failed to catch him. Fellow Pole Kamil Stock was second and Stefan Kraft of Austria third. It was the success of Polish ski jumper Adam Mawisz, who won four world championships between 2001 and 2007, which first propelled the sport from relative obscurity to something of a national passion in Poland. That's all from the news. Thank you for watching. Stay with us for the weather, business and more besides. But from me, it's have a good night and a better tomorrow. I'm Aleksandra Zarzycka and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Temperatures will grow up a little to 4 degrees in Wrocław and 3 degrees in Katowice. On the northwestern Poland, temperature will range about 0 and 1 degree. The coldest place that night will be Mazowsze, Lubelszczyzna and Mazury with minus 2 degrees. Cloudless sky is expected in most regions. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. Temperature will increase to 7 degrees in Katowice and Wrocław. On the northwest, temperature will range from 5 to 6 degrees. More sunlight will appear in Podlasie. Rainfall is expected on the west. Let's check the weather for the next days. On Sunday, temperature will range from 6 to 12 degrees. Rain will appear on the northwest and in central Poland. Monday will bring us more rain and higher temperatures from 8 to 13 degrees. On Thursday, rainfall will appear in Podlasie and Śląsk. In other regions, more sun is expected. Thank you for watching and goodbye.
Global and Daily Business Edition. Tonight on the world stage, we will speak about Iran and um, the politics uh, of this country towards Europe, towards the United States, and the politics of the United States towards Iran, which is very aggressive, and the United States are pushing the uh, regime in Tehran. One of the recent uh, events is that the foreign minister of the country um, lost his job or uh, he uh, gave himself uh, up uh, to the, the mission. Uh, Witold Repetovic of Defense 24, one Good of the man. specialists of the Middle East, is our guest, sir. Welcome to the show. So why the foreign minister of uh, Iran, the person who constructed the deal with Obama mm -hmm. administration regarding mm -hmm. the oil and uh, easing the tension, uh, gave up? Uh, first of all, uh, he yet, yet he didn't uh, lose uh, his job because uh, his re resignation uh, must be accepted by the president uh, of Iran and also by, by the supreme uh, leader, the Rahbar uh, Ali Khamenei. Uh, and uh, it is open question if it will be accepted uh, by both of them. Uh, mm, and. Uh, uh, the reason he resigned, uh, the direct reason he re resigned, uh, was the visit uh, of. Uh, well, it is. Um, people say uh, media, Iranian media also say something like that. That the reason was uh, the visit of uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, in Tehran, uh, and uh, Zarif was not invited uh, to the. Uh, meeting with with him, uh, uh, Assad met uh, Khamenei, met uh, Rouhani, and also on the meeting there was Qasem Soleimani, who is the uh, um, chief responsible uh, for uh, foreign operations of Pazdaran. Uh, Pazdaran is the, the revolutionary guard. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, um, and the, the Qasem Soleimani's uh, influence in uh, foreign policy is very big, but it is completely of different uh, quality. Uh, it is completely different face of uh, foreign um, uh, policy than uh, Zarif's. Uh, Zarif is an open uh, face. It is a, about diplomacy. Uh, Soleimani uh, acts uh, uh, secretly, uh, generally. So. Uh, so uh, it was uh, for, for Zarif. Uh, it was uh, s somehow an offense, and uh, uh, that he was not invited. It was also a sign uh, that uh, of lack of uh, trust uh, to him. Uh, so, so he sent this uh, resignation. Generally, Zarif's uh, situation now is uh, difficult because uh, he is a face of the, this policy uh, of openness uh, to, to, towards the West. And after uh, Trump's withdrawal uh, from uh, the agreement, uh, Vienna Agreement, so. Uh, after that, uh, and uh, after reintroduction of, of the sanctions, uh, economic sanctions on uh, Iran, uh, this uh, policy is near to be to, to collapse. Uh, Europe is still trying to um, uh, rescue this uh, this uh, agreement, uh, but uh, there are a lot of. Uh, um, uh, political um, political forces in uh, Iran well, that, that, was my, that were th that was against about my question because we mm -hmm. see Iran as a monolith like a it singular it, it, it was, it is never... entity and is it to what degree this is a case no 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 it is not a case uh, it is far from being uh, a monolith uh, it it always was far from being monolith it is uh, i i could uh, speak uh, long 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 time about those divisions uh, in iran it is very very complicated um, so uh, but uh, simplifying uh, these divisions the 
groups of hardliners that uh, from the very beginning of uh, these uh, negotiations uh, with, with the West uh, about the nuclear program, uh, they were against uh, this uh, deal. Uh, and only the green light from Ali Khamenei made it uh, possible to to, uh, to make this agreement. But uh, for uh, Zarif, uh, all the time his uh, uh, this was not only uh, the deal, but uh, he talked directly with uh, John Kerry, uh, with Americans. Uh, this was very. Uh, um, uh, fragile, uh, sensitive po policy, so uh, dangerous for him. Uh, mm, but it was accepted. Uh, it was accepted uh, all, also because uh, there was the success, but now this success uh, evaporate. So mm, uh, this is uh, more and more dangerous for, for, for Zarif. Uh, the uh, hardliners, uh, are uh, expected to sh strike back uh, against uh, Zarif to show uh, you lost, you lost, you, you should pay for that, that you lost, um, and uh, and uh, this is a real effect of uh, Trump's policy, and it is opposite to uh, to what Americans uh, expected the effect of their policy will be. But it is not the first time. Uh, Mm, Americans they basically are wrong they expected that they will strengthen those who want to make a deal, those who want to bow yes. to the pressure. Yes, yes. But it will not happen. It will not happen, but the economical situation of Iran is, is not rosy, to say. Uh, uh, economic uh, situation uh, is not good, but uh, mm, first of all, the, uh, I don't think the government will pay the, the highest price the people will, will pay and there will be no revolution uh, because of that mm, uh, after all also Iran has other possibilities there are countries that will not uh, let Iran to collapse Iran is not isolated like China, uh, yes. yeah, like China uh, also Russia mm, who is the uh, beneficent of, of this American policy because uh, Russia and Iran are not uh, natural uh, allies. Uh, uh, in fact, Russia is interested in this policy of isolating uh, Iran because uh, because Russia benefit of this isolation. When uh, Iran uh, will be able to. Uh, make uh, cooperation to. to um, We're speaking about the oil price and uh, the Iran as a major exporter. No, yes, cutting yes, from but the not only. Other uh, markets. Iran can uh, um, sell uh, not only oil, also gas uh, to Europe uh, through uh, the route uh, through uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and it will um, uh, be very bad for, for Russia which is obviously a competition. Witold Repetovic of Defense 24, sir, thank you very much for this thank insight you. to the Iranian policy. We seldom talk about that yet. We should because it is important. And that was it for tonight's Poland Daily Business. Welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tomorrow. Temperature will increase to 7 degrees in Katowice and Wrocław. On the northwest, temperature will range from 5 to 6 degrees. More sunlight will appear in Podlasie. Rainfall is expected on the west. Now let's check the weather for Europe. In the Balkans, temperature will range from 11 in Sofia to 18 in Athens. Still warm on the Iberian Peninsula, their temperature will range between 19 and 21 degrees. In British islands, we will expect it little rainfall and more sunlight. Thank you for watching and goodbye.
The Polish People's Republic was a state in Central Europe that existed from 1947 to 1989 and the predecessor of the modern Democratic Republic of Poland. With a population of approximately 37.9 million inhabitants near the end of its existence, it was the most populous state of the Eastern Bloc after the Soviet Union. Having a unitary Marxist-Leninist communist government, it was also one of the main signatories of the Warsaw Pact. The People's Republic of Poland represented an era of many paradoxes. On the one hand, the reconstruction of the country from war damage was accompanied by enormous social enthusiasm. On the other, it was impossible to escape the intensified party propaganda of success, and the scale of persecution by the security service was unprecedented. The average inhabitant of the People's Republic suffered the consequences and limitations resulting from the inefficiency of nationalized industry. However, it was also a time of great creativity and resourcefulness. In today's episode, I'm with Artur Gurniewski at the Museum of PRL in Warsaw, and we will be discussing the history of the communist times in Poland. Hello, Artur, and welcome again to Poland Daily Culture. Hi, Paula. It's a pleasure of mine to be invited again. It will be a pleasure of mine to answer your questions, to, uh, to tell you about this period of time in our history. Thank you. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the communist times? Well, tough story, very important one. And uh, these are the moments of two generations in our history that really checked us as a Polish people, as a Polish nation. If we are that much determined, if we are that much stubborn to have our independent country on planet Earth, and uh, I think that we passed this test. But there were many moments and aspects of communist uh, Poland that are mm, felt and are affecting our nation till nowadays. So look, uh, we thought that the worst moments in our history were World War II times. So that the, actually these are the moments that somehow united our nation, united our country, because the enemy was obvious at these days. But then after World War II, after it turns out that Poland becomes a satellite country of Soviet Russia, on one hand we are an independent country when we look at the map. But on the other hand, we are having another government controlling us mm -hmm. because we are the, behind the Iron Curtain. But this is something that Polish people didn't know right at the beginning. So look, first, these moments that we are talking through, all these episodes, so moments when we lost the independence to Russia, Prussia and Austria yes. in 1795, and then we got back the independence. Then there is this very clear moment when Poland got back the independence in 1918, and our culture um, is going back on the track. Uh, so, like we were talking before, a uh, Polish gentleman was dressing up like a Londoner, Polish lady was dressing up like a lady Parisian. from Par exactly from Parisian, uh, from Paris, Coco Chanel stuff and things. And then World War II comes very, very difficult moments in our history. And then 1945, the war ends, we get back our independence. Mm -hmm. And this is a moment when my great grandfather becomes a head teacher in a school and he's responsible for counting the votes. So we are voting, what will be our government like? So he was involved in literally counting the votes. And then he gets to know on the news that more than 90% of Polish society voted on the Communist Party mm -hmm. in a moment when he knows that no it's more than true. 10 or maybe 20% voted on this party. So this is how you were getting to know that something else is happening than you are thinking. So this is the beginning of propaganda. This is the beginning of something new. Mm. Now, we must remember that there are two sides of this story. 80% of German losses during World War II, after 1941, after the moment that Adolf Hitler attacked Joseph Stalin, were lost because of Russians. So they really took the price. They really sacrificed a lot. Uh, Russians and Chinese people, two biggest biggest sacrifices during World War II, about 20 
million of Russians were killed during World War II. So now Joseph Stalin is given his prize, this part of the world, up to Berlin. It belongs to Joseph Stalin, so he wants these lands. We must remember that World War II victory of Russia is undoubted when it comes to historians. And now, what will you feel like when you are a Polish citizen after World War II? So do you think this way? Or do you feel like you are living in 100% independent country? Which direction will you go? Because it turns out that if you were fighting against the German forces during World War II and Russian government finds it out, then you have a very big problems. Uh, because why did you fight, now this is a part of propaganda I will be telling mm -hmm. at the moment, why did you fight against the Germans if great Russians came to help you out? So, we are in between the rock and the hard place as a Polish people for 44 years. And this is the first thing that comes to my mind. I was two years old when communism ended, so I cannot remember much personally, but I didn't have to make very difficult choices that Polish people had to do in here while communist occupation, because every single Polish man had to make a decision if they are cooperating with the communist government or they are not. Mm -hmm. If you decide not to cooperate with the communist government, then undoubtedly you are making a heroic decision. You are once again fighting for your independence, but you may be suffering for nothing as well because you don't know how it will be. So maybe you will sign the documents, maybe you will cooperate with the communist government, but this is how you are becoming a sort of, a sort of traitor, because you are officially against the Polish nation, you are looking for people who are not on the Russian side, but maybe you will sign the documents so to be like a wolf in sheep skin for the communist government. So we are having so many aspects that I wanted to present at the beginning of our conversation. And now what path will you choose? I would like to just put it in a time phrase for people who maybe don't know how long the communist times uh, lasted. So if you could tell us just how many years it was and that it was just very recent that it ended actually and how Poland has developed since then. Perfect. 1945 is a moment when World War II ended and we are having this uh, celebration and of reborn Poland. And it takes place on 22nd of July 1945. Mm -hmm. So uh, 22nd of July is a new date that appears in our history. Then on 22nd of July, the Constitution Square that we are next to is opened, 1952. 1955, the Palace of Culture and Science, 22nd of July. Uh, 22nd of July, 1953, the first section of the Old Town is opened where Mr. Bierut announces it. Mm -hmm. So 22nd of July starts to be a very important date for the communist government, and I will tell you why. Because on 22nd of July 2007, mm -hmm. we are having co um, the constitution of Napoleon adopted in here, which was like the new beginning of Poland. So from the very beginning, communist government knew that they wanted to establish the new beginning in here. And it lasted till 1989. So to so answer 30 years your question, ago. 44 years. So it ended two years after Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Um, so these are the periods of time that we are talking about. And two years after you were born, as yes, you mentioned. Yes, I was born exactly in the year when Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Uh, yes, there is more and more I got to know um, when it comes to this uh, amazing period of time that till nowadays affects us, our life. Uh, sometimes we are conscious, sometimes not that much when it comes to um, uh, this everyday life. So what is an example of that? Oh, for instance, um, I can um, see that 
um, when it comes to current develop, development in a, a capitalist companies, and I worked for some uh, capitalist companies in here in Poland, in Warsaw, I can face two different attitudes to different generations. So for us, people who were born, let's say, after um, 1980, so people who were growing up capitalist world, mm -hmm. we understand capitalist roles. Uh, so for instance, if I want to work, uh, I understand that I must bring an income to the company that will make it worth hiring me. Mm -hmm. But in communist days, unemployment rate equaled zero. So there was a very popular statement during communist days. It doesn't matter if you stand, like when you work or you lay down, mm -hmm. you are supposed to be given uh, 1,000 slot anyway. So it would be enough for your everyday products, everyday needs. Aren't these two totally different points of view mm -hmm. that were somehow adopted by people who were growing up in communist days mm -hmm. and now the world has changed, now capitalism has came totally opposite communism was about bringing equality to society. Everyone was supposed to have a job, unemployment rate zero. And in the capitalist world that we know, we must work a lot. Fight for ourselves. <laughs> fight for ourselves because no one will have mercy if we will be not efficient in our jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today, we are visiting a manor house in Gyalki to learn the history and the functionings of a manor house owned by Polish nobility. We will speak to the owner of this very manor house, Woldemar Guiszki, about the history of Polish manor houses. The manor house of Szlachta, or the Polish nobility, served as a center for Polish culture throughout centuries. And during times of war and the partition of the nation, it also functioned as a bastion of freedom. During the time when Poland is partitioned by foreign powers, I know that the Polish manor house is also a base of operation when it comes to organizing resistance and solidarity movements. I was wondering if you can elaborate more on how it's conducted. Dwór był zawsze bazą powstańczą w czasie the manor was always a base for uprisings. During all the uprisings, insurrections, it was the center of the fight against the invader in every partition. The manor paid a terrible price for this, the worst one can imagine, particularly in the Russian partition. The gentlest punishment was being forcibly deported to Siberia, leaving your family, losing your manor and all your assets, and losing all contact with Poland. Russian owners would then take their place and was often the case that the heir was simply murdered. This occurred most intensely during the Bolshevik onset, particularly to the east, but also during the Second World War, when Poland was attacked by the Germans from the west and Russians from the east. When the people sent by Hitler or Stalin went into a manor house, they began by murdering the heir, that's unfortunately how it happened. The manor was always the basis for national uprisings, also during the Second World War, and the struggle of the Polish Home Army and the National Armed Forces, but as I said, they paid the most terrible price. Resistance can be taken in many forms, and we know that the armed resistance is actually a small minority of the entire movement against the partition of the nation. And can you tell me more about how that part of the resistance is being conducted? 
We dworze spotykały się dwie, trady- dwie polskie wielkie tradycje, dzięki którym odzyskaliśmy niepodległość. Two great Polish traditions met in the manners, thanks to which we regained independence. Primarily the romantic tradition, when, sorry to say, but sometimes we went gung ho into fights, when we had no real chance, but the uprising erupted anyway. W momencie przyszła refleksja po powstaniu styczniowym zwłaszcza. At a certain point, though, particularly after the January uprising, there was some reflection that this path is ineffective. In relation to this, we started to do things in a different way. Alongside the romantic tradition, the positivist tradition came about based on the idea that the society is an organism and all the components of this organism make up the whole, so those who are at the top had a duty to take care of those who are below them in the hierarchy. So the peasants had to be educated, taught to read and right, taken care of medically, assisted in learning professions, taught crafts. It was mainly about having peace of mind that this organic work in the lower layers, this positivist work, would have a positive effect when placed into a military capacity in the future and help in regaining independence. There was this peasant mania, such as in Galicia. Marrying a peasant wasn't seen as a misalliance anymore. This happened. Lucian Rydel and the most famous Polish wedding described in the famous play by Vespiański, Wesele, or Wedding, it described a wedding with a peasant girl, a type of marriage that would once be unthinkable. So it was about seeing those in the lower levels of society as partners. The nobility began to understand this, implement it, and raise the level of those at the lower levels. Next up, we will talk with the historian Shishov Yabonka about the role the Polish manor house played for the resistance against the partitioning powers during the 19th century. Both during the period of active resistance, during the national uprisings, but also in the organic work of preserving Polish identity and culture. The Polish manor was the seed of patriotism and was also the base of operations when it comes to resistance against the foreign powers that partitioned Poland at the time. And I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about it. Immediately after the separation of lands in the Polish Republic, and let's remember that all four lands of the Republic were separated during the time of the partitions, the manors became the one place that did not allow the invader to enter through their gates. The family of the marshal and great Polish patriot Józef Piłsudski is a well-known example. His mother never let in a single Russian soldier, and she only spoke to them in French. French, never using the language of the enemy. From this, it can be derived that the Polish manor became the fortress of independence. All the uprisings, and there were seven of them, from Tadeusz Kościuszko to Józef Piłsudski, were propped up by a network of manors, Jewish taverns and monasteries and presbyteries. There was a war for the allegiance of the Polish peasant. In the region of Greater Poland, this went very smoothly, because for a short moment during the Napoleonic period, the peasants were given freedom, and shortly afterwards their own land. krótki moment epoki napoleońskiej chłopom nadano wolność, a wkrótce i ziemię stali się obywatelami. They became citizens. On the other hand, in the Russian partition, serfdom remained. The peasants spoke Polish, but they hardly even knew what Poland was. A tragic situation occurred in the Austrian partition, where in the face of an uprising against the Austrians by the Polish nobility, the Austrian authorities knowingly provoked and consented for the peasants, who were very often very simple people and illiterate, to attack and slaughter the nobility in 1840. In truth, the majority of the nobility left the manors and went on to the cities, but the management remained, the people responsible for the assets, and they died. 
500 manors were destroyed. This caused a great trauma. Poles fighting against Poles, fratricide organized by foreigners. The aim was to avoid this in the future, and from this came the biggest Polish uprising in 1863, which was based on the manors fighting for the affranchisement of the peasants. This means giving the peasants land and citizens' rights. From the moment the national government made the decision to transfer land to the peasants, the gathered Congress of Gentry announced that the peasants must be given coats of arms, they must be considered nobility now. The peasants were considered at the level of the nobility, the Tsardom decreed it. Finally, towards the end of the 19th century, peasants in the terrain of the Polish kingdom, land occupied by the Russians, were freed in the best way in the entire Russian Empire. They received the biggest amounts of land, they were given parts of forests, lakes and ponds, they became landowners. Their children and grandchildren would go on to fight for an independent and civic Poland, which would become a true homeland. We have this Poland now, although the period of Bolshevik occupation and the rule of the communists destroyed the manners, which they saw as hotbeds of nationalism and backward ideas and feudal relations. They destroyed them in a horrific way. Countryside had a lot of respect for manor houses, for the most part, because they were always the centers of culture. Here you could receive medical help and most importantly, this is where young girls were taught how to run the household, how to sit by the table, how to behave in a cultured way. Noble ideas permeated the town folk and vice versa, folk music reached the manor houses. This is how a modern new Polish nation was created from Polish folk customs and the nobility as if melted together. Of course, in between, there were also the middle classes and a group of Polish Jews mentioned before. They constituted the fourth state of the Republic. The whole thing rested on the support of the Polish Church. The tradition of Polish manor houses have seen a revival after the fall of communism. Hopefully, more and more of these amazing estates will be repaired and rebuilt back to its glorious days. That's it for today. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. Welcome to Poland Daily Travel. Once again, we are on the Royal Route, where we trip the light fantastic, checking out the most important sites along perhaps the most fabulous boulevard in the entire country of Poland. Yes, we'll be coming to you from the Humidor Room in the beautiful Raffles Europejski Hotel, newly refurbished and opened in 2017. This is one of the premier hotels, not only in Poland, but in Europe itself. After leaving the Raffles Europejski, we'll head to the Royal Route, where we'll continue our walk, which started in the cathedral in the Old Town and continues today up to Nowy Świat. That is not just today, but the next several days, we'll be on the Royal Route, and we'll be showing you all the ins and outs and what's important to know. It's an exciting trip. Poland Daily Travel, the best travel reporting about Warsaw that you've ever seen. Stay tuned.
we're back with Poland Daily, and we're here on the Royal Route, Krakowski Przedmieszcze, and we're standing in front of the house where Chopin lived, and where the poet and artist, one of my favorites, Cyprian Norvid, also lived. He's a very interesting man as well. Um, Arthur, could I get you to put on the music? Push the button. Yeah, yeah, because they have and that music you're hearing is the elegant music of Frédéric Chopin, obviously. Um, all you have to do is uh, you can sit on the bench, and they have these benches all the way up and down the street in this part of the Royal Route, and you can uh, be entertained by the, by the music of Chopin. Um, what, what, tell me something about, tell us something about the, uh, when Chopin was living here. Frederick Chopin was living in here ever since he was 17 years old. 17. So 1827. Uh, and he lived in here till the moment when he had to emigrate from Warsaw, never to come back. Right. That's why we call this place nowadays Frederick Chopin's Saloon. And that's why it became very popular for Warsawians ever since Frederick Chopin left this place. Okay. And uh, he lived here with his uh, parents, correct? Yes, he was living in and here. And his sister? And uh, his older sister, Ludwika. Ludwika, who uh, rescued his who, heart. And yes, and, the, and to after all Between her breasts, nice lady, that's good a, lady. That's a, yes. Yeah, dependable. Uh, yeah. Very much Not a indeed. lot of ladies will do that. Uh, Not a lot of ladies will carry your heart across... Uh, the borders. Foreign borders. Yeah, okay. But she did, okay. Well, especially uh, they such here. heart. Yeah. Uh, well, the heart to be very important for us. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, these are these these, these benches uh, that provide us Frederick Chopin music. Also remind us of amazing heritage of uh, his uh, uh, masterpieces in here along the Royal Route. In this very building behind us called Chapsky Palace. Uh, also mentioned poem writer lived, uh, Cyprian Kamil yeah. Norvid. Have you ever heard of him? I have. I think he's, he's one of, as I was said in the introduction, he's one of my favorite uh, uh, poets and, and Polish writers of the uh, 19th century. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I really like uh, Cyprian Norvid's stuff, and he's a good painter as well. Well, to yeah. understand his masterpieces, you must really be able to understand a lot. So I highly congratulate you this ability, because it was impossible Wait for... Wait a second, you don't give me too much credit. <laughs> no, I just, absolutely. I this just is, happen to like the guy. That's, that's <laughs> how it is. The people of yeah. his days didn't get him. Well, I think this is inter This is one of the things I like about him. Is you, uh, I tend to favor underdogs, and uh, I really like the, the, the dedicated life he lived. He refused to give up, no matter how difficult uh, other people found his work, or uh, no matter how much he was rejected, he kept going. And in the end, he was rewarded with a big plaque next to Chopin and, and greatness, uh, as it were because of his dedication. I think that's really something. So yeah. I appreciate it yeah. so much that uh, as, a, uh, as a person not originally born from po in Poland, you understand the context and also can deliver this information in such a nice way also regarding our history because nowadays Cyprian Kamil Norwit is considered to be one of most important Polish poem writers of a period of time when Poland was not on the maps. Uh, but in these days, people didn't get his point of view and couldn't understand him so correctly. Uh, so that's so nice that we hear about him nowadays from you. Oh, well, I, I just, I happen to come across him, and as I say, I'm no expert. But let me read what we've got here. It says, Chapsky Palace. The Chopin family began living here in 1827. Frederick was given a room at the front with his own piano. He had a room at the front with his own piano, and he remained here until he left Warsaw forever in 1830. Part of this residence has been preserved. The second floor windows were those of the drawing room, the family's drawing room. So the second floor windows was the drawing room. Now, the second floor would be here or where the plaque is? Yes, exactly. Okay. And uh, uh, today, a museum containing Chopin memorabilia 
uh, is there. And we can tour it um, by going in to uh, the courtyard behind us. But we're not going to do that today. We'll do it another time. Uh, but we have to ask the people and get permission if we're going to go in there with cameras. Anyway, so here we are, uh, two great guys, side by side, shared the, the same uh, premises at different times, Norvid later. Yes. Because his dates are uh, uh, 37 to 39 he lived here. So just a, a few years after Chopin left and went forever off to France for the rest of his life. Um, so that's, that's amazing, actually. Uh, to think you're standing right where the, these, these amazing and uh, these uh, fantastically talented people uh, lived and worked. You know. So I guess we're headed further that way. Uh, what are we going to do? Go and see Copernicus and talk about him? Let's check out most important astronomer in Polish history or even world's history, Nikolai. Copernicus, as we call him, the strongest Polish man, the one who stopped the sun and moved the earth. Good Lord, what an achievement. Poland daily travel. Hey, we're having fun on the Royal Route. Stick with us, more fun to come. Be right back.